In this Introduction to Microcontrollers video, we'll be examining the microcontroller kit and addressing electrical safety. We'll be working with an Arduino microcontroller. You may not know what a microcontroller is, or perhaps you've heard of the Arduino but you don't know much about it. Well, here it is. This is a picture of an Arduino, off to the right. This is the nano model of the Arduino. It's a microcontroller, which is a small computer. It has a processor, which is where it calculates and checks values. It has memory, where it can store information, and it has ports, where we can attach devices to either provide information, these would be input devices, or obtain information, these would be output devices. Microcontrollers are really small, deliberately. They're often incorporated into machines. They're devices that carry out specific tasks. This constitutes what's called an embedded system. An example of an embedded system is a washing machine controller. You turn on a washing machine by pushing buttons to give information. This would be the input to the system. The processor uses the input information to determine what actions to carry out. For example, if you decide the wash is cold, then the microcontroller only allows cold water into the washer. You could also have sensors connected to the microcontroller that detect whether or not the load is balanced. If it becomes unbalanced, the microcontroller could suspend the wash action and output a signal to alert you, say, a buzzer. The layout of the system is like this. First, we need a computer that we can program. A Linux OS laptop is suitable. We will use the integrated development environment, which we call the IDE for short, to write instructions for the microcontroller. This is code or programming, okay, the program that we write. This is sent to the Arduino as input. We can also use the IDE to evaluate data that is output by the Arduino. The IDE is software for building applications that combines common developer tools into a single graphical user interface. We connect the computer to the Arduino using a Mini-B USB connector. This is both an information connection and a way to power the Arduino. We could also power the Arduino using a 5 volt battery. We often connect the Arduino to an electric circuit via pins. These are ports that allow us to, to um, put on input and output devices. Um, these pins correspond to actual physical pins protruding from the Arduino. The circuits may be connected to other things which allow them to control things like machines and motors and whatnot. The Arduino Nano can also connect to sensors via pins. This is a good way to get information like temperature, light, motion. Sometimes the sensor is connected to a circuit. The programs that we write on the computer are sent or uploaded to the Arduino. These programs are sets of instructions used by the Nano to carry out tasks. The Nano may control the action of a circuit by sending information or commands to the circuit. The circuit may send information back to the Nano. If there is a sensor connected, generally it provides information to the Arduino Nano. This information may modify the action of the Arduino. It may also be sent back to the computer for analysis. The data analysis can take place within the IDE. Now let's look at the microcontroller kit. This is something that we're going to need to use along with the computer every time that we have a class session. So make sure that you have it with you for every class. First, there's the Arduino Nano, which we've already looked at a little bit. So we see here that the Nano has these pins, these legs sticking out of the bottom. Okay? And these are where we can make connections to other devices. On top, every pin sticks up a little bit from the top of the board, and each one has a label. And these are important so that we know which pin we're dealing with when we're looking at it from above, because generally, the pins 
we are not dealing directly with them. Um, we're not, they're embedded in other things. We may not have direct access to them, as you'll see as we start working with it. There are also on the top of the board four small lights, light emitting diodes here. Um, the ones I want to draw your attention to right now are the two that are closest to us in the diagram uh, in the figure. One is labeled POW and the other is labeled L. The one labeled POW should turn on with a red light as soon as the uh, nano is connected to power. This lets us know that it is powered up and is able to communicate um, or work in some other way. The other one, the L1, is one that we'll be looking at later, uh, but this one is an important one as well, so I'm drawing your attention to it now. The next component that we want to look at is the mini B USB cable, and this is what it looks like. So you'll see that it has two ends that are different from each other. The one on the left is a standard USB connector, and that's um, a connector that can, um, it makes it possible for you to attach this cable to your laptop. You have at least two USB ports on your laptop. The other end you connect to your Arduino Nano. So you see, this is how you connect it. Um, it's shown with the red arrows. So you should be able to insert the cable directly into um, the end of your Arduino Nano and then the other end into your computer. And then you should see the red light come on, the POW light come on. The next component we're gonna look at is the breadboard. The breadboard is a flat board that has lots of holes in it. They're labeled. And this is what we use for composing circuits. Then there's the multimeter. The multimeter is a device that we use for making electrical measurements associated with various circuit components. You should also have jumper wires of various sizes. These are used for connecting components to each other and to the Arduino. They are coated with insulating pl plastic of different colors that help to tell the connectors apart. We also have a whole bunch of resistors. Resistors are elements that use energy and that are placed in circuits to control the flow of electricity through the circuit. There are different types of resistors. The first type that we're going to look at is the fixed resistor, and you have a lot of those. They're in a little bag little Ziploc bag and they are cylinders, small cylinders that have stripes on them and they have two wires, one sticking out of each end. So they, they're considered two terminal devices because we can use those wires to connect them to other things. These are fixed resistors, meaning their values do not change. Their nominal values are indicated by the striping on each of the cylinders and these are encoded. Um, you'll also find that um, the uh, brown tape that's used to hold them together, you have several sets of them, and on each of the brown tapes binding a set of resistors together is written the nominal value of that set of resistors. So that's a way for you to tell what they are for now. Uh, we'll provide you with the color code chart later on. There are also other kinds of resistors whose resistance varies. For example, there is the potentiometer. Potentiometer is a three terminal resistor with a sliding or rotating contact that allows us to vary the resistance. So you see the three legs on the bottom. Those are the three ways it can be connected. And then on top, there is a dial. And as we turn the dial, it varies the resistance of the potentiometer. Um, we should have at least two of these. Then there is the light dependent resistor or LDR. This is an electronic component that is sensitive to light. When light falls on the top of it, okay, you see the top, um, the resistance changes and you should have two of these. Then there's the thermistor. The thermistor is a thermal resistor. The resistance is dependent on temperature more so than in standard resistors. You should have two of these. So this is all the resistors that we have in our microcontroller kit. 
Other things that we have in the kit include light emitting diodes. These are lights of various colors. These should be familiar to you. They're everywhere. Christmas lights contain LEDs. Lots of things have LEDs. You'll notice that they are two terminal devices, meaning they have two ways they can be connected to other things they, by the two wires that they have each sticking out of them, but that these wires are of different lengths. And this is important, and we'll address why they are this way later on. Then there are buttons. These buttons also are two terminal devices. They're used for making connections. We can use them to turn things on. You should have several of these. Then there's the slide switch. The slide switch, particular type of slide switch, it's a dual pole single throw slide switch. It's a sophisticated switch for turning a circuit on and off. It's more sophisticated than the button. You should have several of these in your kit. Then we have a motor and a motor driver. The motor driver is an integrated circuit that allows the Arduino or some other microcontroller to easily control a direct current motor, the motor on the left, for example, it can actually control up to two motors. So these is, this is the complete inventory of all of the components that you should have in your microcontroller kit. If anything is missing, you need to notify us and we will give you replacement parts. So now that we have an inventory of all the things, we need to look at what we're gonna do with them. The first thing we need to consider is electrical safety. So what needs protection? Well, clearly it's people first and then equipment second. It's not that the equipment is important, it's just that obviously people are way more important. But then we have to consider how we're going to protect them. There are several ways. First of all, we need to know what we're doing. Secondly, we have to be careful. And thirdly, we have to not be hasty or impulsive when we're working with electric components. So what can go wrong? Well, the things that we're using, these components have physical limitations. If we try to push too much electricity through them, they can be damaged. They can start to smoke. They can catch fire. They can actually blow apart. If we take two objects that are charged that aren't supposed to be together and we put them together this can cause electric charge to flow and that can lead to a spark um, it can lead to one or both of them being damaged the most serious problem that we can have um, that would be contrary to safety would be electrocution electricity wants to flow it seeks a path it'll flow through whatever it can find that will allow it to conduct okay. um, we know that, you probably know this actually, that um, metal is an excellent conductor of electric charge. Another thing that conducts electricity well is water. So these are, the, these are areas where you have to be very careful. But the human body is also a very good conductor. And so it is possible to have electricity flow through a person when it's not supposed to, pass through the heart and cause the heart to the heart rhythm to be disrupted, the heartbeat to be disrupted, which can be fatal. So we definitely don't want these things to happen. Other things that can go wrong, burns. The components in the circuit use energy, and sometimes that energy is converted to heat. So they dissipate power when the, when the um, electric circuit is active, and they can heat up. Um, and that can, if we touch them, then it can lead uh, for us that can end up causing us to burn ourselves like so if you have a circuit that's active Be careful about actually touching the components because if the circuit has been active for a while They may have heated up and you could actually burn your hand um, The other thing that can happen is we can have a short circuit. There can be a spark or an arc um, a voltage arc and that can also cause injury Now if something goes wrong, it's important to tell us Please don't be embarrassed. We don't want anyone to get hurt. We also find that we learn from errors. Every semester, there are at least several nanos that get completely fried because people connect them wrong and too much electricity flows through them and they burn out and so they have to be replaced. You won't be able to do the work that you need to do 
um, if you end up with a fried nano. Okay, so it's important to tell us we will replace the nanos that are broken, um, that get fried. It's not a problem. And then we hope that you and we will learn from this what not to do next time, what things to avoid. So there are ways that we can avoid problems. Here are several. Uh, one thing is you don't want to ever put the nano directly on top of your computer. Okay? The second is you want to always stand on hard surfaces or make sure that your feet are touching the floor. You want to have your computer sitting on the table. Um, it is possible that you might be wearing something that would conduct electricity. This is not really going to be a big problem. I mean, we're, not, we're dealing with very low voltages, small amounts of electricity, basically. So this is not a huge problem, but do be careful if you're wearing a metal watch or have some jewelry on. You don't want to lean over, touch the circuit, and have the metal on you end up becoming part of the path of the electricity because then you're going to have current flowing on your arm or around your neck or something like that and then it could be harmful to you. You probably know that the risk of electrostatic discharge increases during electrical storms. This is not something we really have to worry about too much in the class but something that you should know generally for your use of electric circuitry down the road um, just to keep in mind that it's a little more dangerous during a thunderstorm. You also want to be careful about in uninsulated wires. The jumper wires that we use are insulated and this is for your safety so that if you actually touch a wire or two wires touch each other, um, there will not be the passage of current along that. Um, you won't get electrocuted, but we do have uninsulated wires on many of the components. Um, the fixed resistors, for example, have long metal wires protruding from each end of the cylinder, the res actual resistor. and if you touch those, you can get a shock. Be careful about that and be careful about having them uh, not touch other um, conductors that they're not supposed to be touching. The other thing is that if you want to make a change to your circuit, it's very important that you disconnect the power when you're making the change. There can be a great temptation to want to just make a quick change to the circuit a very minor change and to do it while the circuit is active. You don't want to do that because in the middle of making your change you may end up having an intermediate step that is really bad and causes electricity to flow where it's not supposed to, in ways it's not supposed to, that can hurt you or it can actually damage the components that you're using. The other thing is that when you are turning the circuit on it's best not to put your face too close to it just in case you made a mistake in your planning out the circuit and that it's going to cause a problem because we don't want it to hurt you, like to have a component uh, break up and hit you in the face. So these are just some safety tips that we want you to keep in mind because um, it's very easy to, in the, in the uh, context of building the circuits, to get distracted and to forget about safety. Um, it's means that you're not going to get hurt, no one else will get hurt, and you won't damage the components and the other equipment that you're trying to use.